Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. ¡Wow! Gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. At Parker, our purpose is simple. We want to make the world a better place. By working more efficiently. By using more sustainable practices. By developing better technologies. We keep moving forward. With each new idea, innovation, and partnership. We're one step closer to fulfilling our purpose every single day. To find out more, visit parker.com slash purpose. Parker, engineering your success. Your host, Andrew Donaldson. This is Herd Tell. Ah, well, we're going to Herd Tell. It's the year of our Lord 2023, if you can believe it or not. Hope everybody had a great new year as we start out this year, kind of where we last start out this year, kind of where we left last year. Big hot mess going, but we're going to do what we always do turn down the noise, get to the information that we need to discern the times we live in, but I want to start with something a little different. I wrote a piece over at Ordinary-Times.com. We'll link to it. Um, It has a little bit of biography. Those of you that are new to the show maybe aren't familiar with my writing and my backstory, but I wanted to address something, and I did it writing, so I'm going to just read the piece. Uh, Sometimes writing, I put thoughts together a little differently than when I'm doing the show or talking to one of our guests. The piece is called The World is Yours, or at least the size of it is. It's at ordinary-times.com. It goes like this. The way things are now is not how they started, though it is easy enough to forget that when living in moments that are always striving for the future. Just after the new year in 2018, I put a piece of writing up on Medium. Uh, Now, these days, after writing and doing other media for the last four years, that isn't unusual. But all those things from then until now came from that one piece. And I've linked to it, and I'll link to it again in the show notes. Somehow, despite having something like 20 Twitter followers and six Medium followers at the time, folks found it and read it and shared it and shared it some more. And it started getting attention. Some established writers and media folks started suggesting it to other people. And it really grew into a thing and became a really well-read piece, especially for somebody that was completely unknown, didn't know anything about anybody, didn't have any ends and hadn't published it anywhere. I wrote a few more things, and then Will Truman asked if I wanted to, quote, do something more. Famous last words at Ordinary Times, which turned into the place I've been writing and collaborating with ever since. Radio, media hits, my own Herd Tell program, this one, and the hashtag Twitter Supper Club that we all love so much. That all came from folks reading and thankfully connecting with that first piece. Besides being cathartic, parts of getting my own story out, my main point in writing that original piece back then was to make this point about why I got a Twitter account, my first social media of any kind, and started publicly writing while dealing with health issues. When my world started to get dangerously isolated and small, Twitter helped make it bigger. Now, this is a quote from that original piece. Therapy, medication, and support are some of the most important tools for mental health patients. Now we can add to that the ability through technology for that person to reach a wider world when they are ready to reach outside of their isolation. This is a development that should be praised and explored, and if any avenue for piercing the darkness of isolation should be used to reach those that need it. In a nation that is increasingly in crisis with how we care for and address mental health, there are more questions than solutions. The rise and increasing importance of social media and the parts of our lives that are now entrenched in them will no doubt be researched and debated for some time, but one thing we do know is that social media gives each of us a reach far beyond that which we would otherwise have. And with that reaching out, there is always the potential to connect to another person in a positive way, which is good for the health of us all. That's the end of the quote. For all the debate, discussion, and derision social media gets for good, bad, and admittedly sometimes truly ugly, it's a tool. The welder of the tool decides the usefulness of it and the purpose for good or ill. 
hammer can be building a house for the homeless or it can bludgeon an innocent without the metal in the wood, knowing or caring the difference. We, as a people, should be better craftsmen with our technology. Stop blaming our tools. The line goes that the average smartphone of today has more computing power than all of NASA for the Apollo moon missions. In the palm of our hands or the opening of a laptop or a tablet or a desktop or a smartwatch, we now have the ability to instantly pull up the full depth and breadth of human history and all of knowledge. Mostly, we use this immense power that the ancients would have worshipped as godlike to make fun of each other, to trade pet pictures and complain about anything and everything. We have far too often taken the tech marvels of our time and instead of using them to expand our world, utilize that power to reinforce their own tendencies, gathering groups of same think, and generally make an online world that is more comforting and affirming than the real one is. Which was inevitable, of course. Human nature is undefeated. And despite what utopians tell us, technological innovation is going to enhance, not change, what humans have been struggling with since the first two argued over whatever they were arguing about. Seeking affirmation instead of information, feeding on a steady diet of bad news and blame shifts, allows you to self-control your media intake and to let it spoon-feed you, prejudice instead of perspective, and on and on and on. We can do better. The world is not only yours, but you can make your world bigger than the small world, small minds, and small impact of the unworthy schemers, the grifters, the charlatans, the big personalities with big followings that upon closer inspections are just wide ends of the funnel that end up with everything centered on themselves. It only costs you a click and maybe a Google search or three to trust but verify. It costs you nothing to not send that overly snarky and unfairly mean social media post. I know I'm guilty of it too. But you don't lose online points for all the worst impulses no one ever knows about because you took a moment to reconsider and let it go. It could mean all the world to someone else, the very small kindness you put online instead, the world of encouragement, or the honest moment of struggle and overcoming that inspires another, the boosting of signal for a good cause or a great need that needs met, or a righteous outrage that needs more good folks to come alongside it. The way things are now are not how they started. The way things could be if we just start by now striving to make our world online and in real life both, always expanding in the hope of improvement instead of constantly narrowing with ill will and lack of faith with the tools we have. What a world that would be for you and everybody else it's only a few clicks away and some good decisions away. That world is yours. Use it for good. Some thoughts on social media to start out the year. Now that we're in 2023. More hotel right after this. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. Te adoro, Sam. ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en electrónicos, hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. At Parker, our purpose is simple. We want to make the world a better place. By working more efficiently. By using more sustainable practices. By developing better technologies. We keep moving forward. With each new idea, innovation, and partnership, we're one step closer to fulfilling our purpose every single day. To find out more, visit parker.com slash purpose. Parker, engineering your success. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, they're back. Congress back in session. Uh, of course, there's been a bit of a change. Republicans are nominally in charge, meaning they got more members than Democrats, but they've got some problems. Uh, they're going through their leadership elections. Kevin McCarthy's trying to deal with his speakership issues, those sorts of things. Here's the thing on all this. This is going to play out over the next day or two. 
So the math on this is really thin. There, you can only lose four votes in his quest for the speakership, which he's been after for years and years and years. Time. So it looks like he might get it. He can only lose four votes, and he's already got more than five people saying they ain't going to vote for him. Now the Republicans may get their back against the wall and do it anyway, but it's going to be interesting to watch play out. Now here's the thing we need to keep in mind, though. We've already been talking about this. Kevin McCarthy is not liked and not well respected. The job of the speaker is not just to sit and bang the gavel. He's got to control his caucus. He has to push through legislation. And yes, that means dealing with the other party as well. What he's doing to get the speakership, it's detailed in the Punchbowl News. By the way, if you're not subscribed to Punchbowl, make sure you do. Their morning newsletter is invaluable information if you're interested in how things actually work up in the Capitol. Um, I will reference it briefly here. Most notably, um, reading from the Punchbowl news here, McCarthy has revert, reversed direction on his own vow that he'd never change the motion to vacate the procedure under which a speaker can be removed from office. Under the new proposal, any five Republicans can force a vote on replacing the speaker at any time. Now, here's where this gets fun is today in the hallways, one of the intrepid reporters asking him if it had gone down to one, which is kind of the rumor, that'd make it even more untenable. Basically, any time the hardliners want to get a vote of no confidence up on Kev Kev, they're going to be able to do it. Long story short, and do read these full pieces and everything else, Punchbowl and some of these other folks do, some of our great congressional correspondents that cover Congress, make sure you're following them directly. Don't just read a news story about it. They talk to these folks. They know what's going on. Here's the thing. He's promising the world to these people to try to get this speakership, and they're still not happy. He's promised them everything he can possibly give them. So when crunch time comes and he has to make his caucus get in line for a vote, how is he going to have any leverage whatsoever to make them do it, especially if they can just get rid of him the moment they tick him off? This is bad. It's going to be bad for the country. It's going to be very bad for the Republican Party. It's going to be bad for the next two years of this Congress. I'm highly skeptical they get anything done, not just because the Democrats but because of their own caucus is going to be so raucous, they're not going to be able to control it. We need to pay very close attention to the GOP and the way they weld power. Because remember, every single member of the House of Representatives is going to be back up for a vote in two years. And it's a presidential election year. A lot of things can happen between now and then. But if they go into an election with nothing but investigating the last uh, Congress and investigating the current president and not having actually gotten anything accomplished, even with a split Senate, they're going to have a hard time making a case for re-election, especially if it becomes an embarrassing, chaotic mess, which is the start it's off to. And there's a very good chance it stays that way. People don't like chaos. They'll put up with a certain amount of corruption. They'll even put up with Congresses not doing things like pass a budget. We haven't done that in forever or doing good order and discipline and how they conduct themselves. We see what they've tolerated in Congress for the last few years. We see what we ourselves have tolerated it because it's on us. They're not going to tolerate chaos, and they don't want a Congress that's an embarrassment. And then starting off, the GOP is going to have to dig them out of a hole on both counts. More Heard Tell right after this. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, he's a favorite. He's a regular. You have heard him advertised right here on this here Herd Tell program with his own podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. We'll talk about that in a little bit. First, we're going to talk about something we've been talking about as a people for about 50, 60 years, and it's still a dumb debate. Ethan Brown is back on Herd Tell. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Uh, great to see you again. Okay, we're talking overpopulation. You wrote about it in C3. Let's let's back up a little bit of how we got here to this argument. It's actually lessened quite a bit over the last 20 years. But there was a book in the 60s called The Population Bomb. The 70s and the 80s, this was kind of the hot trending thing of, oh, my God, everybody's going to die because the world is overpopulated. It seems to have trailed off. But every now and then it crosses paths with the real radical um environmentalists, and I don't mean the ones that are honestly trying to make the earth better. I'm talking about the cataclysmic, the world's going to end kind of folks. Every now and then they pick up on this 
You hear it over and over again. This is not a new concept. You even mentioned in your article, there's writings all the way back into the 18th century about this kind of stuff. Why can we not get rid of this idea? Yeah, like you said, it goes back even further to an essay by English economist Thomas Malthus in 1798, who said that food production grows linearly and population grows exponentially. And at some point, population growth will outpace food growth and everyone will starve and die. And obviously that's never happened. And we can talk about why. I think that it kind of popped up again lately because on November 15th, the UN announced that the world population exceeded 8 billion people. I think to some that number is scary. To others, that's exciting. It's a sign of human development that our medicine has come this far that we can keep that many people around. But yeah, I think that that may have kind of triggered this discussion, certainly was the inspiration for writing my article, and I look forward to discussing it. You just mentioned it, though. Um, look, there's the old joke, you can make stats tell you anything you want to. You know, nothing can lie to you like a stat. The great Vince Scully talked about stats being like a drunk with a light post. It's not really illumination. You're just trying to prop yourself up. Um those numbers are not all the same. You just mentioned it, the world population, how it ticks up. But, you know, 1.4 billion of that's in China, another 1.3 billion of that's in India. And there's experts saying that it may have already happened, but sometime in the new year, India is going to surpass China. OK, so that's a huge amount of the population just in two of the countries. This is not an equitable thing where you just say, oh, the world's overpopulated. There's vast swaths of the earth that have no human presence whatsoever. Resources are not equally distributed. Countries run differently. There's different economies. This is one of those things really where when you try to make it into a monolithic thing, you really lose all context and you don't get to the truth whatsoever. Absolutely. And furthermore, if we look to where the rates of population growth are going up the most, very often it's in more developing communities. There are studies that show that uh, people in poverty, people with less education, very often have more children than people who do not. And that is completely aside from my environmental argument. Environmentally, I'm not concerned about population growth. Certainly from a perspective of these communities, though, looking at their finances, that does raise questions. So there's kind of a bunch of different angles you can look at. Yeah, Ethan Brown back with us. You go to a historical examples like Easter Island, like uh, things like in uh, the Mayan collapse, things like this. But again, those things don't happen in a vacuum. There was a sequence of events that led to them. One's on an island. One was, you know, a massive empire that ran into modern uh, folks for the first time. And that had disastrous consequences. There's historical precedence for massive swings in population. Civilizations rise and fall. We know that. You brought it up in your piece in C3. This is something we can look to history and draw some conclusions from, isn't it? I think so. I've gotten pushed back on this argument before, but I still like it. I, Easter Island, in my very first environmental course in college, we learned day one that this society had um, basically cut down all their trees and used up all their resources and they collapsed. And this is a common environmental folktale that we'll hear. And I learned in my final environmental course of college senior year that that's actually not really what happened. What happened is at the time that European colonizers arrived to Easter Island, they brought diseases, they brought invasive species, they brought a lot of other really bad stuff. And that was much more so what led to the population collapse. And furthermore, today, there are still descendants of that original Rapa Nui tribe on Easter Island that is said to have so-called collapsed. So I think we can go through a bunch of different examples like that throughout history. But the bottom line is, it's not the same tale of people just using up all their resources and dying. It tends to be a lot of other factors that come in and... I think given that we haven't seen that type of collapse and these are the best arguments that people have, that sort of leads me to believe that maybe that's just not going to happen for the global population. Yeah. For those of you young enough that you didn't see it the first time, wrap a new interesting movie, go watch it, then go read the actual history on it to see how accurate it was. But it is an entertaining movie. You can go watch that. Ethan Brown joining us. Okay, let's get to the to the to the nut of this thing though is the debate here as is so often when we're talking environmental issues or population issues 
we're really trying to figure out how to balance environmental concerns with economic concerns. That's that's where the rubber meets the road on all these eventually when you get down to it. The reason the population bomb was inaccurate and the reason all these theories on overpopulation is we know from economics, if you want to have a bigger economy, you got to have more people. You have to have population growth to have economic growth. That's just a fact. So you either have to do it through natural births or immigration, one or the other. That's the only two ways to get it done. We know that's an economic fact. So they don't, they didn't account, and this is the criticism of it. This isn't unique to me. They didn't account for technological change. They didn't account for population change also drives certain countries to be more prosperous, which allows certain countries like the U.S., like the EU, like others, to go to the poor countries and render aid to them. That's the part that's missing from these, and it gets kind of myopic and a little bit of navel-gazing to the one problem without seeing that, hold on a second, there's also benefits to bigger population. And the environment fits right into that too. I don't even think it's much of a balancing act. The environment is incredible at regenerating. One apple seed can grow a whole tree. One fish can lay a thousand eggs. As long as we are using our environmental resources at a pace that does not prevent them from regenerating, which we are certainly capable of doing, then we can see economic growth through our environment. The environment kind of provides the foundation of economic growth in the first place by giving us resources that we can consume. So I think when we talk about a growing population, I don't think we're necessarily locked into outpacing the way the environment regenerates. Certainly there are examples all over the world of degrading the environment, but we can solve these things by just better managing ourselves. It's not an issue of how many people there are. In fact, we have agency to do things a bit better. Yeah, let's take one of those examples that you use in your piece in C3. We're linking to it. Make sure you read the whole thing. He's also got a lot of links in the piece. That's always the mark of a good opinion piece. You can click through a lot of this and read extra stuff. Let's talk China. That's the world's one of the world's largest economy, if not the largest economy. They have the largest workforce of any country. That's inarguable. You use the example, though. Right now, a lot of the conflict inside of China is because they're smart. They plan ahead. They look ahead. They know they've got a demographic problem going forward, even with their current economic power. And that goes back to the 80s and the 90s and the infamous one child policy. And even though the policy has nominally been rescinded, there's a lot of after effect to that. Now they got a demographic problem. Wouldn't you know who won the pony? If you have one child problem, eventually you stop growing. This is an example you used. All of this is within our lifetimes. This is evidence right before our eyes on this very topic, isn't it? I think this is where the overpopulation discussion goes from interesting debate like we can have on these shows to something actually really scary. In 1980, China instituted a one-child policy. Uh, it led to forced abortions, the confiscation of children by authorities, and a horrifying resurgence of female infanticide to the point that by 2016, China had 30 million more men than women. That leads to a whole host of problems for a functioning society. They have since rescinded it. They went up to two kids and then to three kids. But the psychological effect has still taken hold. You very rarely see large families in China. And I find all of that extremely dark, extremely scary. I don't think that uh, certainly a country like the US is not in danger of instituting something like that. But I think that we can certainly see when we start talking about population control or weeding out the herd, it might make for some funny comedy bits that comedians will do. But beyond that, I'd just don't think it's a productive conversation. Yeah, Ethan Brown joining us. That leads us to my biggest complaint about things like the population bomb model or the Malthusian model or whatever you want to call this line of thought. There's no version of that that isn't anti-people when you get down to the core of it. We know we have the evidence before us. Yes, there are rich and poor. Yes, there are developed countries, underdeveloped countries. But if you don't have some economic growth and development, you can't help the people that don't have it. That's just the way it is. That's the way the world works. Yes, there's an imbalance there, but you got to have some wealth somewhere to put wealth to somebody that doesn't have it and lift them up. If you start dinkering around with population growth, and I understand you touched on it on your piece, it gets overly concentrated in metro areas. It gets overly concentrated, things like that. That's a debate for another time. That can be fixed with policy. But the idea that you're going to be anti-human, because what this ends up coming down to is, 
if you start punishing the wealthier countries that are growing, there's not going to be anybody to help those non-wealthy countries growing that does have population issues and does need help. Places like Africa, places like Southeast Asia that are developing that need this help. There's no version of this theory that doesn't wind up being anti-human and we need to be pro-human to take care of humanity. Otherwise, you wind up with what you just said about China. And there's lots of other examples in history. You get some really inhumane things going on that are really dark and ugly. I don't see what the point of caring about the environment would be if you buy into this overpopulation theory. Because if, first off, we're talking about helping the environment to help us as a species, right? If we're talking about weeding out humans to protect the environment, you're also talking about yourself. And I just don't understand how anyone would come to that conclusion. But furthermore, if we look to some of the more extreme parts of the environmental world, there are discussions about things like degrowth models or trying to kind of stay stagnant. And what I've always been a lot more compelled by is the idea of sustainable development, where we can, like I said, the environment regenerates. If we uh, consume resources at a pace that does not degrade our environment too far, but at the same time grows our economy, then we can have both. We can grow our economy and grow our environment, and that can continue for generations to come. So I think that when we're talking about environmental policy, overpopulation kind of just makes it a moot point. Whereas if we understand that we as people have agency over our environment, then we can get a lot of good stuff done. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Maine. Church and Maine is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcasts at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Ethan Brown, this is a little dark, so let's talk about that good stuff. Whether you want to call it a green revolution, whether you want to call it environmental progressivism, whatever it is, all that stuff takes money. It takes a lot of money, especially if you're going to go from a carbon-based economy and a fossil fuel-based economy to a green economy, which is what we're doing is it's going to take enormous amounts of money. And again, there's no way to set. Let's say you have completely pure motives for an environmental agenda, and there's good reason for some of it. You're going to have to have a lot of money to pay for that. There's just no way to extricate the environmentalism and the economic realities. You're going to have to bridge that gap. Now, we're debating it because if you're more conservative, like, look, that's a long ways off. We need to have some bridge stuff. I know our more progressive friends are like, no, let's rip the Band-Aid off, do it now. We can have that policy discussion. But again, there's no way to get the economics out of this. 
that's why you got to focus on the humanitarian part of it because you just said, well, I don't know why folks do it. I'll tell you why they don't do it. It's because it's easier to rant about the economy and it's easier to rant about environmentalism because people are complicated and it's a harder thing to deal with. How do we keep these issues people focused? Because policy wise, just, you know, common sense wise, if they're not people focused, people aren't going to be involved in it. How do we keep them people focused so you don't fall into that China trap or some of this other really bad stuff we're talking about? All of the environmental work I do through my podcast, through my reporting is solely focused on how to make life better for people. I actually was really not an outdoorsy person growing up. I've since come to appreciate it a bit more. When I first learned about climate change, I was really, really overwhelmed because I was like, how the hell do we deal with this? And it it was just so much. But as I learned more, I think my focus always became what makes life better for people, what makes life better for me. I could even take a selfish approach and find solutions. And I think that when I approach it that way, I can find a lot of areas where the environment and the economy or the environment and justice or the environment and health are very much aligned. In the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report from earlier in 2022, they took 43 different climate solutions, compared them against the, I believe, 18 sustainable development goals for 2030, things like end world hunger, create innovation, end poverty, gender equality, all good stuff for people's lives. And they looked to see whether there were synergies, trade-offs, or a combination of the two. And they found that hundreds of those, uh, it was over half of the combinations were all synergies, and only 12 were all trade-offs. Um, that to me is really exciting. That's a big part of why I've been excited to be part of this climate conversation, because if we were having this discussion 10 years ago, yeah, it's a war between the environment and economy. A lot of these technologies had not gotten to a place that we could feasibly implement them yet. But today we're in a much better spot and much more exciting spot. And that makes me excited to be a part of it. Yeah. Ethan Brown, let's talk about that excitement for just a second, because you know, when you talk about these issues on your podcast, The Sweaty Penguin, you use a lot of humor and you use a lot of comedy because, and you touched in it on your piece, people just get overwhelmed with it because it's either doom and gloom or we have to do this right now because the earth's going to all fall apart or you get the other side that's going, well, this is all a big scam and it's all just a money making thing and it's a new religion and whatever. And both of those things are true in small doses on the extremes, but there's also this wide swath in the middle where we can have some conversations, right? You mentioned it to close your piece out in C3. You said, you know, people just get overwhelmed. How do we cut through the noise on this stuff to find, you know, not just the policy things to discuss, but finding the people that are of good faith enough to have the discussions with that aren't the doom and gloomers and aren't just the everybody's crazy. How do we turn down the noise on this stuff? Because it is overwhelming to a lot of folks that don't understand all the ins and outs because this stuff's complicated. That's exactly why I created my podcast, The Sweaty Penguins. That's exactly where I was. I was way too overwhelmed to even get into it. And it took me kind of forcing myself to take some environmental electives in college. And then I was like, oh, this is maybe something I can get my head around. Let me do a dual degree with it and then start trying to communicate this to others. So the Sweaty Penguin starts from a perspective of humor, which I think can get people in the door, especially young people such as myself. But from there, I think one thing we do very well is really just try to take bite-sized pieces. We'll do one topic at a time, whether it be a food, an animal, a specific fossil fuel project, a, a theory that we want to discuss. We'll bring in an expert. We'll talk about it. We'll present the facts. And we're doing it from a context of the fact that we are making progress. The people are not going extinct on Thursday. We can have these conversations in a reasonable framework and then we also discuss not just how these issues affect the environment, but also the economy, health, justice, security, et cetera, and how it's affecting just people's day-to-day -day lives. And we talk about solutions in every episode too, which I think is important, not just existing solutions, but also where we could go in the future. I think all of those strategies that we do on the podcast are things that I'd like to see more of in this climate world. And I hope that I don't, claim the sweaty penguin is your one-stop shop for all climate things, but I think we can be a good introduction for people to get into the conversation, start to learn about it, and then go forward and research more. Yeah, Ethan Brown. 
uh, did his school on at Boston University. Not that you can tell by that giant two thirds <laughs> of the screen plaque that he's got over his shoulder. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, free plug for them. Um, but you do good work, my friend. Uh, you just mentioned the sweaty penguin. You also do a lot of writing. Uh, you do that in a, in uh, conjunction with PBS. That's a good get. You're also one of our great young voices contributors. You got a lot going on, my friend. Let folks know where they can actually find your stuff, find the sweaty penguin, follow you on social media, keep up with you until we get you back on her tell again, my friend. Well, you can find me on Twitter at Ethan Brown 5151. You can find the Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, all that good stuff. Uh, you can find Sweaty Penguin on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Patreon at patreon.com slash the Sweaty Penguin, where you can support our show, get bonus content, get some merch. So yeah, go check us out. And thanks again for having me, Andrew. Yep, you'll hear the ad right here on Hertel. Happy to support our friends. It's a cool program. It takes it at a completely different angle. Make sure you check it out. Ethan Brown, always happy to talk, sir. We'll talk again soon in the new year. Have a great holidays with your family. You too. Take care, sir. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, we're in the credit where credit's do business here. Uh, we give people credit for what they do. We don't give credit for things you don't do. That's just basic adulting stuff. This George Santos story up in New York is bonkers. Pretty much everything about this man is a lie. Uh, we can hash that out some other time. We've already covered it in a couple different places. There's a great write-up at ordinary-times.com about it you can read about. This man's a fraud. Uh, there is a little bit of a problem here, just generally speaking, because there's not a great mechanism to not seat him. So basically, they would have to seat him and then vote him out. And the GOP is full of just people that don't have a whole lot of integrity right now. They've got a narrow majority. We'll see if they have the spine to do the right thing here and kick him out of Congress, since the list of folks in Congress that should have already been kicked out is already about a half dozen deep. I'm not going to hold my breath, but we'll see what they do. Anyway, when this story broke, the first thing a lot of people said is, how did this not get caught before the election? Well, this is the credit where credit's due part. Local news media did catch it, just nobody paid any attention to them. Uh, the North Shore Leader is the paper. Uh, this is the Locust Valley, Huntington, Glen Cove, Oyster Bay, uh, Suffolk County, Long Island type area. Uh, this is written by now Fitzgerald. Uh, Well-deserved headline. Look, you know, when you're right, roll with it. The leader told you so is the headline. U.S. Rep. Elect George U.S. Rep. Elect George Santos is a fraud and a wanted criminal. Uh, this is Niles' piece. We'll read it verbatim. In a story first broken by the North Shore leader over four months ago, the national media has suddenly discovered that U.S. Congressman-elect George Santos, this is a Queens Nassau district, dubbed George Scam Toast <laughs> by many local political preservers. Uh, Quick parenthetical here. Somebody online did the old Mentos commercial, but with Santos, very good stuff. Back to the piece. Um, is a deep fake liar who has falsified his background, assets, and contacts. He is, in fact, a wanted petty criminal in Brazil. The New York Times published a lengthy expose on Santos this week detailing that virtually everything Santos has said, filed, and published about himself is a lie. Santos claims to be a wealthy man. That's in quotes. In a corporate finance who owns mansions in Oyster Bay and the Hamptons, was a graduate of Barak College, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and attended NYU, lost four co-workers in the 1920, lost four co-workers in the 2016 mass shooting at the Pulse nightclub, has millions in cash assets, has even spoke at a local synagogue claiming he's Jewish. All lies. Instead, Santos is really just a petty criminal from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He currently wanted in Brazil on criminal charges of committing elder fraud and check forgery. He stole checkbooks from the elderly patients of his late mother, who was a home health care nurse, and forged the checks to steal merchandise, according to prosecutors in Brazil. Santos owns no real estate, according to the New York Times, and the leader's earlier reporting. Remember, this is from the North Shore leader. These are the folks that was on it before everybody else figured it out. Um, according to the Times, he's a high school dropout who earned a high school equivalency diploma, which there's nothing wrong with that, but don't lie about it. He claims to have worked for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, which he didn't, 
None of the victims of the Pulse Mass Club shooting had any connection to Santos. And Santos's mother, who passed away in 2016, God rest her soul, and whom Santos has claimed was, quote, Jewish, was instead a devout Catholic named Fatima, a name he allegedly Jewish parents after a Catholic pilgrimage site in Portugal. Santos shed many tears at a local synagogue describing how his family escaped the Holocaust. Even more serious are the huge financial claims made by Santos in his federal election filings and personal disclosures filed with the U.S. government. Many of the reports, including an alleged $600,000 loan, that's in quotes, from Santos to his campaign, appear to be fake, as do huge dis disbursements to Washington, D.C. quote-unquote consulting firms that experienced Washington, D.C. professionals said they've never heard of. Quick pause here. Uh, even as big as the D.C. campaign business is, most of those folks all know each other, at least hurt each other. You've only got a couple degrees of separation. If campaign people have never heard of where your campaign money's going, something fishy's going on. Back to the piece. Santos declared his net work in 2020 to be less than $5,000, but he made a $600,000 loan just a few months later. And now in 2022, he complain, claims he's worth $11 million. You know, my Frametown Elementary School math ain't great, but that don't add up. Uh, lying on federal disclosures, back to the North Shore leader here, lying on federal and financial disclosures is a federal criminal felony with each violation facing up to five years in prison. By the way, we know this because he had to do a filing with Congress when he won. According to the NYC court, Santos was evicted twice in the past five years from rented apartments in Queens for non-payment of rent. He claims to now live in a rented apartment in a row house in Queens. However, the Times reports no one knows of him at that address. More disturbing are the connections that Santos does have. A recent report in the Daily Beast, Santos took more than 56000 from a Russian money man, money man named Andrew Interer, a cousin of Putin crony Viktor Veskenberg, who is under international sanctions. After receiving Russian money, Santos attacked the Ukraine. Go figure that one out claiming the government of Ukrainian President Zelensky was, quote, fascist and, quote, totalitarian and implicitly supporting the red invasion of Russia. Under criticism, Santos later backtracked and then claimed he was actually, quote, Jewish and, quote, Ukrainian. The leader has pre... Sorry, this guy's just... He's like an SNL skit that just won't end. The leader has previously described Santos as a fabulous of a fake who makes false claims and lies to everyone. Local political observers have characterized Santos as being like the pathologically lying con artist protagonist from the film Six Degrees of Separation starring Will Smith or the talented Mr. Ripley starring Matt Damon. He fools gullible wealthy people into giving him money and now has conned himself into the U.S. Congress. Santos will be sworn in January 1st as the new congressman for the New York's 3rd Congressional District, which consists of the towns of Oyster Bay and New North Hampstead and a small portion of Northeast Queens. So credit where it's due, North Shore leader, they get to curl a little bit because they were on it before everybody else. Look, folks, what do we tell you on this program all the time? Turn down the noise, get to the results. When it comes to campaigns and political folks, one of the first things you ought to check is the money. FEC filings, especially the quarter ones and campaign ones, are public record. You can go on the line and look at them. If you looked at his, you'll see all kinds of filings that are for $199.99. The reason for that, everything over $200 has to be itemized and explained. Uh, this man was clearly laundering money through campaign things. This is all going to come out. The lying's bad enough. The financials are probably criminal and will be looked into, but local media matters, folks. So little praise to the North Shore leader. Well done, folks. We'll link to this piece. Read it for yourself. More Herd Tell right after this. All right, let's end on a good note. Let's go to West Virginia. Yeah, I know I'm a homer. Deal with it. Uh, Metro News, Morgantown, West Virginia. This was written by Mike Nolting. Uh, we'll link to it as always. Officials for the Your Community Foundation of North Central West Virginia have announced the formation of a new fund as part of a $1 million matching campaign to help build the IMPACT Fund. IMPACT is an acronym there. For greater regional grant making, the YCF Volunteer Leadership Fund has been established with $25,000 donations 
from a former YCF board member and his wife who wish to remain anonymous. The fund honors all past, current, and future volunteer leaders of the YCF and its two preceding organizations, the Greater Morgantown Community Trust and the Community Foundation of North Central West Virginia Incorporated. The new fund honors Dr. Billy Coffendaffer, whose donor described as an inspiration and a mentor who exemplified what a volunteer leader should be. Coffendaffer was the first executive director of the Greater Morgantown Community Trust from 2002 to 2005. In 2005, he transitioned to the board of directors and assisted in the merger that formed the YCF. In 2015, he became the first emeritus member of the board. Coffin Daffer and his wife, Norma, also volunteered with organizations like the Morgantown Area Chamber of Commerce, Riverfront Development Groups, Drummond Chapel, United Methodist Church, Goodwill, that's where I get a lot of my clothes, Rotary, Kiwis, the WVU Alumni Association, and Community Living Initiatives Corporation, which helps create the village at Heritage Point. It's inspiring to see the former board members continue to be involved, connected, and passionate about the community, said Martin Howe, YCF's current board chair. We thank the donors who established this fund, Dr. Coffendaffer, for his service and all the past and current volunteer leaders who contribute time and talent to YCF's success. This new fund creates a permanent way to recognize our volunteer leaders while supporting charitable needs in the community. The annual earnings from the YCF Volunteer Leadership Fund will be distributed in perpetuity Sorry, P words and hillbilly accents don't go together. Distributed in perpetuity by the YCF for charitable needs in Harrison, Mary, and Monongalia, Preston, and Taylor counties. The unrestricted fund can be used to provide community relief and can evolve over time. As part of the YCF's $1 million match campaign, the $25,000 donation is being matched 100% by another anonymous donor, an unrestricted grant making funded benefiting five county region in north central West Virginia. There's also information if you would like to give to this. We will link to that. Good for them. My favorite part of that whole thing, though, is how a legacy of volunteer and giving has bequeathed more volunteer and giving. You can build up a legacy amongst people of doing the right things by inspiring others to do it. That's the takeaway here. Thank you so much, because that'll do it for her tell. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you and yours are well wherever you are. A couple quick reminders, a little bit of housekeeping. We'd love to hear from you. We've done whole segments and shows just based off your feedback, questions, things you wanted covered, questions you had. We've even done some on criticism. We've had people hear what we like, didn't like it. We brought them on, let them have their say as well. Hertelshow at gmail.com, Hertelshow on the Twitter. Make sure you're subscribing. It's always free to whatever podcasting platform you get your podcast from itunes spotify google whatever we're even on a couple over in india that i can't pronounce but we get clicks from them so god bless y'all listening to india we'd love to hear from you folks youtube channel uh, a lot of extra stuff on there there's some clips on there the long version podcasts are on there the good talks are all on there those are the interview only segments if you just want to listen to that portion of the program on the youtube channel we also got some big news coming with our radio partner uh, that's going to be changing we'll be out with that information very very shortly yet another way to get heard tell and again all of it's free so make sure you're sharing and telling folks on your own social media about heard tell let them know it only costs them a click we'd sure appreciate it so until we talk to you again for more heard tell wherever you and yours are across the street or around the world we hope you're well we hope you're well fed and we'll talk to you again real soon for more heard tell All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. So, 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 so.